Hey, everybody. Welcome to the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast. Hey, what we do on this podcast is talk about what B2B sales and marketing uh, leaders, operators, and experts are doing today to really break through and grow their businesses at exponential levels. Let's get it in the interview. At the end, I'll give you an update on my courses and you can check out my website at b2brevenue.com and it's Brian G. Burns on LinkedIn. Hey, hey Chris, how you doing? Good to see you again. Uh, what's new? Well, I'm excited to talk to you about um, continue our ongoing dialogue around can sales and marketing actually live together and work together. <laughs> Now, now, have you had much success with that? You know, really having that synergy with sales? You know, it's funny. I have. I've, there's two companies that I've been involved with as CMO, two out of the three, where I actually think, not that we were perfect, but that where we generally got it right. Um, but of course, it's often not, not right. And so, you know, the one that is the big rub, of course, is leads. And so... <laughs> How do you think sales and marketing work together to produce leads that actually turn into revenue? Well, that, that's, I think there's a lot of conflicts there. One, salespeople are hyper-focused on one KPI being revenue, you know, because that's how they get judged, paid, survive. And unfortunately, a lot of times marketing is viewed just on leads. So you're naturally focusing on quantity versus quality right? Because the more, the more you get paid, the more bar graphs during the board meeting look better. Yeah. It's not going to say, oh, I got 10 CEOs at our exact target. And they're probably not in market this month or this quarter, but in three quarters, we're good to go. Yeah. The board says, what the hell are you spending our money on? Right. So I think there's a natural um, conflict there, unless first a lead is defined as something, who are we going after? Uh, what stage are they in? Um, uh, and what do we know about them? You know, yeah. because today, you know, I just got done watching that Cambridge Analytica documentary on Netflix, the big hack. Yeah. Was it, was it good? It was pretty good. You know, there's, uh, it's a little bit long, but th- what I got out of it is like today, there's so much data. So the, the need to find your ideal customer profile in their contact info, that doesn't exist the way it did 10 years ago. It used to be just figuring that out was like a ton of work, right? That was, uh, it wasn't yeah. even a lead, but you figured out who the target buyer is, where they are in the organization, what their phone number is, what their email address is. And that was like a victory. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. And people go, oh, they converted on our website. And I go, is it their real identity or is it their Gmail identity? You know, yeah. and if they, they don't use their Gmail anywhere else. So if you Google it and it comes up blank page, okay, whose territory is that in? Right. Is it in the U S is it yeah. in <laughs> the English speaking world is you have no idea where it is. And all you can do is retarget it through, Facebook ads and stuff and lookalike audiences. So I think marketing and sales got to re- take a new look at what is a lead because also today there's all kinds of services to determine who's in market, mm-hmm. who's searching for these things, not just on Google AdWords, but on content uh, distribution sites, review sites, they're now selling their data. Yes. Yeah, of who, who's actually looking at reviews of your competitors, who's reading articles about the topics that uh, you solve. Those types of things, that's uh, a, a lot warmer than somebody who's just interested in an Apple Watch at a webinar, right? It's, there's, that correlation isn't very tight. Just anymore. because I'm interested in the free watch doesn't mean I'm interested in buying your product. <laughs> Right, because it, it tends to attract people who want to get educated on that particular topic. So it, it's, you're incentivized to make it as broad as possible, how to become 10 times smarter, thinner, and richer in 15 minutes a day, right? That, that doesn't attract <laughs> a very narrow audience, <laughs> but a big one. And so one of the things that I've thought about is sales and marketing leaders need to come together and decide you, you said it right off the top. Who are we going for? 
what's yeah. the what are the job titles where do they typically sit in the organization how does that map to a use case for our product so that that individual is more than likely to be a potential buyer and then i love what you're saying around using some smart marketing analytics to see what else this person might be doing digitally to indicate a, a level of interest. So it sounds like what you're saying, first thing we got to get aligned on is who's the target and be really clear about the use case and, and, and the kinds of individuals we're looking for. And then can we create some marketing, digital marketing signals or sensors that, that indicate that this person might be interested? And is, are those are the kinds of things you want to see uh, for lead scoring and that, 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 that there's a, a scoring bar that we need to get a lead over before marketing hands it to sales? Or, or how do you think about that piece? Well, I, I don't think there's the over. I think there, it exists at a certain stage. So the, the rep, when they're looking through their CRM or whatever they're using to determine how they spend their time, they can see, okay, somebody has uh, been to a review site, has read a review of our competitor. That's a lot hotter than somebody who just exists and we don't know anything about them. No one's connected to them. There's no relationship. There's no history. They've never been to our website. Um, that's a very different opportunity or lead. And I think one of the mistakes we're making today, and I see it everywhere, is that, okay, marketing generated X number of leads. Now they have to be processed. And all of a sudden they're looking at the salespeople, you didn't process them. Well, what does that mean to process them? Right. I, because if it is just a Gmail account and there's no intent, there's no history, there's no context. It's a contact. And the, how many contacts do you have in your territory? You have to go, because this is very different between sales and marketing. Sales goes in time of closure. That's their priority list. If you then go to marketing and it's more volume number of people at certain stages so the, the, the conflict becomes there and i've seen this probably at one of the largest uh companies out there where they they show me their funnel and i go oh you're causing a problem with this funnel because these people have no intent they're your right profile and they attended a webinar but what does that mean how is that compared to something else? But isn't it the job of marketing to do what I think many of us call today lead nurturing, which is a set of digital interactions with them. We can use bots. We can use email. There's a bunch of different things we can use today that, you know, they express some interest. We send them something. They come back. We send them a little bit more. You know, there's things that we can do digitally in a marketing funnel that will uh, indicate higher levels of interest. And to your point, I think this is a very important one, interest in a time frame that a sales rep would give a shit about. Yeah, I mean, having that, uh, you know, the marketing automation at a reasonable pace, I think today also they're, they're kind of incentivized to have the people opt out. You know, if somebody hasn't opened your email uh, in a month, you might want to slow it down a little. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or put them, you know, put them back into a, a different, put them in a dead bucket and, and do a different set of things with them to try to light them back up again. Right. Yeah. But sending yeah. them the same shit that, that you're sending people who are authentically interested in your stuff is a mistake, obviously. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem. There's a lot of people going mad with the remarketing right now because the remarketing networks, if you ever go to somebody's website for the next month, you cannot, not see an ad from that company and just because they went to the website and if they're not clicking on the ad after the fifth time well maybe you want to get a little time in there they're probably not quote unquote to use your term in market they're in they're market. browsing or they accidentally were looking for one thing and bumped into another or whatever it is yeah they might want your content so if they if your content isn't directly linked to the problem you solve then that content did not attract somebody who is looking for your solution. So it and sounds think, like what you're saying is, hey, let's have sales and marketing get together. Let's decide who. And let's decide what the criteria of behavioral indicators, if I could use that phrase, are um, that would indicate that this is somebody who needs to engage with a person in our sales organization. Yeah. 
And maybe there's four to six things we look for. We use that in our scoring system. We have digital nurturing, whether it's just email or bots or whatever it is we're doing, so that we can show to a a particular sales rep, hey, so-and-so came in. This is how we found them. They were on these shopping sites. They were reading these articles. We've sent them these two or three emails. Our bot interacted with them. And as a result of these things that we've done and things that we've uh, analyzed, it would appear this person's raising their hand and saying, they're either ready to buy or they're getting close to ready to buy. And now is the time to engage with them to see if we can bring them through an actual sales cycle as opposed to a marketing cycle. Yeah, I think that's really good. And I think also uh, marketing would serve themselves because it'd be easier and sales by engaging your key target accounts into your content strategy. So say, a, say what you mean by that. Okay. Uh, let's, let's say you're going after Microsoft okay, or a, any company, XYZ, doesn't matter. And you have a blog series, you have an ebook, you have some piece of content. You invite those people to participate in that content. Why? Because you all of a sudden break the ice with them. They now know you, you're marketing, you're less threatening than us evil people <laughs> over on the other side. The only thing worse than a marketing person if you're a customer is a salesperson. Right. Yeah. So you're almost as good as engineering. <laughs> you know? But you can talk and complete a sentence in some ways. <laughs> so they're much more engaged to do that. You, you elicit their opinion. You view them as a thought leader. You will give them credit in the, in the content and reference them. But in, in an organic, natural uh, useful way, not these listicles. Oh, oh here's the 7,000 people you should follow on LinkedIn, just with the hope that they will share it and f- be flattered by it. But you engage them in the content process. It yeah. educates marketing, it engages the client and breaks the ice. So one of the things I've seen work, and I'm curious to get your reaction is, okay, so we know who, so there's targeted things marketing's doing. We're measuring the behaviors of the who so that when the who, the person we're interested in, starts to behave in ways that indicate to us that they're getting ready to buy or they're certainly more interested in it. We, we, if, if you're the head of sales and I'm the head of marketing, we've agreed when a customer or prospect does these sets of things, they've cleared the bar and now it's marketing's job to hand that over to sales. Let's say you and I as the marketing and sales leader agree on all that. How do we then, you as the sales leader and me as the marketer who wants that lead to turn into revenue, what are the things that you as the sales leader then do to uh, manage, to incentivize the salesperson, given it isn't a bullshit thing from marketing, it's the real thing that you and I agreed is the real thing. Now, how do you on the sales side uh, provide the right incentives and do the right management to make sure the sales rep actually uh, follows up on that lead and hopefully turns it into revenue? Well, I think that those things should be natural. And if they're not natural, it's a signal that something's wrong. And what's usually wrong is the salespeople look at those leads or attempt contact with them. And either they're too busy with other stuff, which means they've got too much territory, or <laughs> which might be hard to imagine a rep would, that would admit that. Sales manager will. But I... I've been a rep all my life. If I see something that I can turn into money, I turn it into money. <laughs> you don't have to twist my arm or incentivize me outside of my compensation plan. Yeah, you know, say, like, oh, but here's I somebody. Have, I have seen sales uh, leaders who say, you know, there's an extra Scooby snack if you fo- if you can demonstrate following up on a quote unquote truly marketing qualified lead. That, so they, they provide extra incentive. Do you, are you saying that's not necessarily required? Uh, if if you got their buy-in, you got to ask the rep, why wouldn't you do that? Are you making too much money? You're either making too much money, you're lazy, or for some reason you don't believe that it's worth your time. Or you have too many leads that you're following up on. Uh, too many. And so they have to look at it and they go, oh, that account will never buy. We talked to somebody else there. And, and there's, there's a lot of variables. Or th- that person is too high level, too low level, temporary, contractor. and Some of those are legit. Some of them aren't. And I think this is what, this is the conflict. And like, let's say you go to a trade show, you come back with 300 leads. Okay. Most of them won at the coffee cup or the eraser 
some the Chotsky, they didn't want to hear from a salesperson and get a demo. Right? They, so, but you're right. And if you torture them to contact them, you, you get a, the, uh, the Darwinism should take effect. Yeah. Right? That, that the cream will rise and the people will be super focused because as a sales leader, you want your team focused on the most important stuff in the order in which it will close. And if they're not covering it, you either need more salespeople or educate them on why this is a good lead. And, and this is what happens is if you get a thousand leads and they might go through it uh, chronologically or alphabetically, but that's not the good order. Right. You know, because not all leads are equal. And how often do you think the head of sales and the head of marketing should be sitting down and reviewing this saying, okay, last week we produced X number or last month, whatever it is, we produced X number of what, what you and I agreed were going to be marketing qualified leads. I, as the marketing leader, have to be open to feedback from you that says, well, maybe some of this is bullshit. Maybe it's not, right? Because there's bullshit in marketing. You as the sales leader, leader also need to be open to the fact that I might say, hey, listen, you know, my campaign managers are telling me your regional VPs aren't following up with the reps to make sure that they're, you know, so there's going to be bad behavior on both sides. We both admit that we're, we're bros. We're, we, we yeah, both man. care about the number. We're on the same side, right? Yeah. So how often do you think the head of sales and the head of marketing should be analyzing at a, a country, at a region, and even to some degree, depending on how big or small the company is at a rep level, um, how well a marketing's doing it, producing real qualified leads, not the bullshit lead, the Glenn Gary leads, and b <laughs> how well sales is doing it, following them up. And to your point, if that's not happening naturally, something's wrong. The leads that's are shitty, wrong. the territories are too big, the reps are lazy. Something's going on. How often do you think sales and marketing leaders should sit down and analyze this? I'd say probably every other week. And and if that mojo doesn't exist, because I've I've rarely seen it exist between uh, marketing and sales, and unfortunately, it was very early in my career where I saw it exist, where it was easy. Marketing's gotten even harder than sales, I think, because today I'm much more of a marketer than I am a salesperson. You know, I market almost all day long, and I know how hard it is now, and I know what you get in is like, well, what the hell did I pay money for this, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Because well, of course you're never really sure what's going to work. And then, and then even when things do work or like when they don't work, sometimes it's really hard to figure out why. And then <laughs> I'm in this situation right now <laughs> with my podcast, which is like, wow, it's really working. And I'm not that sure why. <laughs> right. And, and sometimes you do know why. And you're like, why didn't I think of this five years ago? You know, why didn't I put this fusion together instead of just trying to become better at something that doesn't seem to be working? Yeah. And, and go ahead. Go and ahead. I think also that, you know, the, the very best people that you really want to talk to typically aren't going to fill out a form and don't turn into a classic lead. Okay. You may get them interested, but do they convert? Okay. You don't know that. Yeah. But if you're marketing to the right people in the right way, when the, when the cold outreach goes, they're like, yeah, I know about you guys. I, I attended that webinar, but I put some bullshit name in. <laughs> right. 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 So you wouldn't call me. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm trying to be uh, Jason Bourne about this. <laughs> yeah. Or they, they delegated it to somebody who doesn't want to be revealed. And, and that happens all the time. Yeah. You know, because when you do get called into an account, it's typically not the decision maker or the, um, you know, the fox behind the, the curtain. It's, yeah, it's, it's some, not a C-level executive that makes no. that call, right? It's somebody I, who works for somebody who works for somebody who works for somebody. And then this is the conflict that happens between sales and marketing. Because if, if the sales leader doesn't understand how marketing works, meaning that you're not going to get CEOs uh, asking for a demo right? That, that you have to do some brand building awareness, word of mouth, influencer, uh, get the right topics discussed by the right people. And that's hard to do. It, it's a very iterative and it's hard to measure, mm -hmm. right? So if, uh, if it doesn't have something that's measurable, then what you need is the sales leader going, no, Christopher's doing the right things. You know, it, it's not showing in leads maybe, but when we're engaged with the account, they know who we are. Yes. 
They don't know our competitor. And that's often why I have found that in the B2B space, a named account model is so powerful, right? Yes. Because if your reps have, on average, I don't, I'll make up a number, 25 accounts. Well, guess what? As the CMO, I can work with my campaign management team and say, okay, here, here, here are Brian's reps who are deep into these accounts. Here are the newer reps. Here are the brand new reps, right? And, and we can together, in a fairly analytical way, figure out how we begin to do, you know, air wars into those accounts to begin to soften things up. We can hire an appointment setting firm if you need that. We can, you know, there's things that you can do in a very targeted, focused way. You can do all that nurturing. You can invite them to webinars. You can invite them to conferences and events. You can invite them to baseball and football. You know, there's a set of things that you and I, as a sales and marketing leader, can work on when we know exactly, A, we want these companies and B, we want these kinds of titles in these companies. Yes. And that, especially you can advertise directly to even individuals today, companies, titles, geographies, you can get it really micro focused and you can guess at their email addresses. Those, those aren't hard to find anymore. And you can connect with them on LinkedIn, download your emails, stuff them into a lookalike audience. You, the creativity you can do. Now, if you start measuring teams on leads and follow-up leads, you start to get wrapped around an activity and a KPI axle instead of an effectiveness. You know, I think the, when a CEO hears from both the CMO and the CRO that, hey, these best people I've ever worked with, that's when you know you got the synergy. And what ends up happening if you, if you keep the barrier, the, the transactional level at the lead, all of a sudden it becomes, you know, the finger pointing at the end of the quarter or taking credit for it if it works out. And I, I learned early, you know, I had that in my first CMO gig. I got, I got stuck in that you know, washing machine and spit out the other end. I learned how stupid it was. And that's why I think my next two times around, I just didn't let that happen. I tried to over communicate with my counterpart in sales and I tried to drive that level of cooperation in marketing and sales. And so I, I only made this mistake once, this stupid lead conversation where you tell me the leads are shitty and I tell you your reps don't follow up. And we do that every quarter. It, Who wins? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wins. And by the way, while we're doing that, the competition's kicking our ass, right? Right. And, you know, the, the CMO sits down with the CEO and says, ah, oh, you got to get a new VP of sales. And right. just the op. And all of a sudden, well, guess what happens? The new leader comes in and there goes six months of indecision. And we start all over again. And meanwhile, yeah. the competition, if they're not having this dumb conversation, if they're doing the smart stuff that you and I are talking about here, they're just getting more and more distance from us. Right. And, and that's it. And when, you, when it works together, at least people know that they're doing the best. That their heart's in the right place. The energy's going for the right things. And if it's not working, we're going to pivot. Yeah. And we, we agree to that. Now, switching topics, I believe that the most important skill you can have in business, and certainly one of the most important skills in life, is selling. And I think for marketing people, and a lot of people look at me sideways for this, I say, if you want to be a legendary marketer, skill number one is to be great at selling. Because if you can't sell one-on-one, -on -one, in, 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 in a very real sense, marketing is sales at scale, right? It is. And so... If, if you were advising me or other marketers about becoming better sales, uh, having better sales skills, what would the, the kinds of things you'd want me to work on? Well, I think you got to meet your customers, meet your prospects, go talk to them and, and you get away from the persona. You know, the persona is useful at the macro level, but when you start talking to your ideal customer profile, and you hear about, you know, what do you read? What do you care about? What do you not care about? Uh, how do you determine what you want to spend your time and money on? How do you get rewarded? What are the emotions that drive you? And what on the both the positive and on the fear side? You know, how do you get canned? You know, what keeps you out of jail? All of these things, when you start understanding, you start understanding the drivers, right? And from that documentary, they go into psych ops. Right. And it's like how the military, this is all election based. So it's, it's, you're trying to change a core belief of somebody. 
you know, either get out and vote or vote for the different person. And they don't do it on desire. It's always on fear. There's never like, oh, this person's brilliant. It's, oh, no, that other person does weird things in the bottom of a pizza place. You know, <laughs> it's all this craziness. But if you don't really know your clients and they don't know you, then what are you really working with? You're working with an academic view of the marketplace, not a realistic view of it. And I find it stunning how many marketing people never go on sales calls. Oh, it's work. It's tough. It's not pleasant. It's not, you know, you're, you're a fish out of water. Um, and it's, it's very different. You know, you got to fly somewhere. You got to prepare. You got to sync up with people. You got to make sure you don't step on anything. <laughs> yeah, you got to. So every once in a while, you got to stay at a Motel 6. Uh, you know? you got to have that Marriott coffee. <laughs> yeah, nice Danish in the morning, the, the cheesy eggs. And the <laughs> yeah, just get the, get the old artery. Did you miss it? <laughs> artering, hard, hard, harder, harder, hardering right now as I think about oh, it. <laughs> well, I think you're on an interesting point, which is uh, I know marketing people who will say, oh, sure, I'm happy to come when the customer visits. You know, and I'll be part of the customer visit day for this customer. And that way I'll be in touch with customers. Well, that's valuable. You know, when I was a CMO, I did, and I know you've done a million of them. However, I think you're on a very important point, Dr. Burns, which is as a marketing leader, you got to get on a plane. You got to go meet prospects in Singapore. You got to go talk to, uh, uh, you know, customers in, in, in London and in Germany and in, Iowa or wherever your prospects and customers are, because the customers who come see you at your corporate office, they're the, exactly. They're the high, they're the, the high in interest. You're, at the altar. you're already at the altar. Yeah. You're not dating. Right. You, 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 the goalie is looking the other way. Like you got a high likelihood of closing this sale, right? Yeah. They're not flying to you just to see a demo. Right. <laughs> right. They want to make sure you exist. They want to get the CEOs together. They want some skin in the game. And then, of course, the sales call we all love to go on is the sales call in Germany with the auto manufacturer who's been using our product for two years and the new version just blew up and now they want to kill you and you're meeting with a C-level executive in <laughs> wherever Germany and you're like, oh my God, right? But we as sales, as marketing leaders, and frankly, I think it's any C-level executive in the company, you got to be in the field going to those customers, pissed off existing customers, prospects. Who require who are you are going to look you straight in the eye and say hey listen two hours ago we had so and so in here from your competitor and like you need to tell me why and they're going to be hostile with you 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 need to be in the real world yeah and I think even listening to like um, initial calls and demos that are recorded if you listen to those you'll you'll hear what questions they ask and it's is there so a funny one? it's so funny you say that my old buddy Rob Burgess who is the CEO of Macromedia. He told me about doing this. He was noticing something wasn't right with their telesales numbers. It was sort of looking weird. So he decided, fuck it. I'm going to go down and sit with our telesales reps and listen to them, right? Just listen to what's going on. So he listens to a few calls uh, with customers who are ready to buy. And it, it, he discovers, and, you know, they were selling, I don't know what, what the average ASP was at the time, but, you know, three to 500 bucks a throw kind of stuff, maybe 1200 bucks a throw, but not, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so they would get to the part of the sales cycle where the customer is about to buy. And then unbeknownst to Rob, the sales rep would email the customer a credit app and they would lose a lot of sales in the credit application. Yeah. Right. So he said, no credit apps. If they say they want to buy and they're a GE or some company that sounds real, either take their credit card or just ship them the software because we're talking about 500 bucks. And so with just a simple insight like that and getting rid of, in this case, a, uh, a, a credit app process, um, they were able to increase sales in their inside telesales. I'll, I'll, I'll give a free secret that'll kill my startup business in that the number one thing that get more sales for early stage startups is throw away the NDA. You know, it's the same thing. It's like, God forbid. <laughs> you know? And anytime, I, how many times a, a CEO calls me up and goes, hey, can I send you this NDA first? I go, are you really going to tell me anything <laughs> that I care about? Uh, you know, 
am I going to sign? I've signed a hundred of them, but I've never paid attention to them. Have you ever seen an NDA get litigated? I've never even heard of it. And here's the stupidest thing about, first of all, I don't sign any document that's a legal document unless my lawyer looks at it, right? That's point A. It's like, okay, so it's going to cost me a grand to come talk to you. I don't fucking think so. Point A. Point B, people are confused about NDA. Somehow they've gotten it in their mind that the NDA means that I can't steal their idea. It doesn't mean that at all. All it means is I'm not allowed to talk about their idea. And oh, by the way, how are you going to enforce it? Right. So are there still, there are still startups who require prospects sign NDAs? Yeah. Well, I mean, any entrepreneur thinks what they have is the next Facebook, the next um, whatever. And yeah, it, they usually learn it from their investors where their investors will never sign them because there's nothing in it for them. Well, and the other thing too is, I mean, I, like you, talk to a lot of entrepreneurs every year. I, I can't sign all these things. I don't need any of these people coming back on me. It's ridiculous. And so I just tell people, don't tell me anything you don't want me to know. And if you don't want me to know anything, we can get right. to each other this hour back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, literally I had a, a company and it took two weeks off their sales cycle just by getting rid of the NDA. I go, wow. it's unenforceable. It's a total waste of time. And I can't tell you. I've, I've given the deck to people and they, they just email it to the competition. Believe me, there's no secrets anymore. You're on the, the age of the internet, right? There are no secrets. There's no such thing as an internal email. We're all living. Right. Nature, You're right? in Gmail. They read your email. <laughs> they tell yeah. you they read your email. <laughs> no, exactly. You can send one email to somebody in your Gmail that says, hey, my wife and I were talking about going to Italy. And then all of a sudden, there's all these Italy ads. <laughs> Positano. Looks like a wow. beautiful place. Looks wonderful. Ah, Chianti, whatever. <laughs> How'd that happen? <laughs> oh, well, and that's it. People, any friction. You're able to increase sales for startups just by getting rid of that stupid NDA. Right, because there's two weeks because, of course, no engineer is going to sign it. So they give it to legal. Legal's got to add value, got to call their legal. Their, the clocks start ticking. And, of course, the startup doesn't have on staff legal. They have to have their call it. All to talk about a product or a service that is pretty vanilla. You know, everybody thinks what they're doing is so unique and precious that, you know, if, it, if that ever got out... <laughs> God forbid the Russians get a hold of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and well, let's face it, why did SaaS become successful? You're, you're reducing friction. I can buy it by the month. And it, why would anyone need a credit check on if you have a SaaS product? They don't pay their bill, you cut the surface off. Turn them off. Yeah. Yeah, I always wonder about this. Like, I, you know, I'm sure I, you like I, you want to try new software for whatever you hear about something that's cool for your podcast or whatever, whatever it is. We, we're, we're, you and I are hearing about new software that we might use for something we do all the time. You go to the website and if there's like, if it's like five screens to get through to set this thing up, you're like, at most you should ask me for my email address and maybe a password to get in at most. But like, if there's any more friction than that, yeah. Uh, like, go, go fuck yourself. Why are you making this so hard? That's it. A any kind of friction. And marketing needs to learn that because there's all kinds of friction on the website. There's friction for the demo. There's friction. All of these things. And everyone's trying to get rid of it, right? Because when you're on the website, you either fill out a form or conversation. They can very quickly determine who you are, where you fit, who the rep is. Get the calendar link up if you want to pick a time. You know, because friction is the death of revenue. It just slows it down and it goes to die. And it's more apt to die than it is to live. But some companies are friction manufacturing machines. Oh, God, tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Burns, anything else you'd like to touch on today? No, it was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. I love you. <laughs> Hey, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Hey, I want to make sure you're checking out b2brevenue.com. That is where you can get a free copy of an ebook that I did. It's a real ebook. It's not um, uh, a fluff book. It shows and talks about how companies make buying decisions and how you can influence that from both a marketing and a sales standpoint, how to find all the people that are in the decision path and what they need to see, know, and touch and feel before they make a product selection. 
If your team needs some coaching, some help, some training, some systems, some processes that do work today, because we know what doesn't work, or you know what doesn't work, I'm, I'll show you what does work and how to connect and get into pretty much any account. Uh, it includes deal coaching and content community, and I can customize it for your particular company. Just so go to b2brevenue.com, look under training, schedule a call with me. We can talk it over or just sign up. Uh, you can pay per month or all at once, whichever makes most sense for your budget. Also, uh, I put out videos pretty much daily on uh, LinkedIn and on YouTube. On LinkedIn, it's Brian G. Burns, and on YouTube, it's Brian Burns Sales. Just search for that if you like to consume some video content. And if you see me on LinkedIn, uh, please put a comment and a share and a like on some of the videos. I really appreciate it. I've got a company page for each podcast. Uh, this one, the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast, where I put both content and humor uh, videos out daily. And tell a friend about the podcast. Really appreciate you listening. Check out the show notes for all the partners and the connections you can make there. Uh, the coupon codes for the products to evaluate them, see if they're a right match for you. And we'll see you next time.